The New Nation Part 2 today on the Miss Meyer Show. It's raining tacos. So what are we going to talk about today? We're continuing on with our new nation part two, and we are going to go through all of these things and try to get done as much as we can and not make the video super long. So that's my goal. Well, what we're going to talk about first is going to be the early political parties. Remember we talked about the differences in the plans, the great compromise, the three fifths compromise, um, the New Jersey plan, all those other kinds of things. Well, now our government was becoming established. And we had two early political parties. This is before we had Democrats and Republicans. We had, and you guys remember, Republicanism was not a political party to begin with. It was a, a, a way of living. It was a political ideal, not a political party. So the first political party that we're going to talk about is called the Federalist. Now the Federalist emerged in the 1790s under Alexander Hamilton. Remember, not everybody liked Alexander Hamilton. He was a rich boy, um, really dressed, well-dressed, well-spoken, well-educated. And the majority of people who were in America at that time were not any of those things. So Alexander Hamilton really wasn't that popular. In fact, remember, he had to pen the Federalist Papers anonymously. so that Because if people knew that he was the one writing them, they wouldn't read them. So Alexander Hamilton supported a strong central government, and he believed in a broad interpretation of the Constitution through the Elastic Clause, meaning that the Constitution can kind of be molded to fit many different things. A lot of people like to say that we are living in George Washington's America or George Washington's ideals of America. I disagree. We are living in Alexander Hamilton's ideals of America. The early founding fathers, with a lot, most of them, with the exception of people like Alexander Hamilton, um, truly believed in less government. Alexander Hamilton believed in more centralized government. Federalists, as like Hamilton, supported um, a creation of a national bank. Now you remember that this is after the Revolutionary War. We were seriously in debt. We had no money, we had no finances. So we needed to be able to pay for going on. I'm just trying to move my camera because this light is like right in my face. Um, and I'm like two-faced, y'all. You see like one side's like super white and the other side's like peachy. I'm like Harvey Dent, two-faced. Love me some Batman. All right. So the Federalists, like I said, supported the creation of a national bank. And they also supported Hamilton's desire for the U.S. to pay back its debt for the Revolutionary War. Um, we still owed France a ton of money. And without having this national bank, without having a centralized government, without having taxation, how are we going to pay it back? So Federalists were supported by merchants, and merchants are people that sell goods, and traders who were encouraged by the strong principles of the centralized government, meaning that merchants and traders were doing business with other countries. So of course they wanted to make it so that they could make money and uh, have good relationships with these other countries. So they supported this national bank. Because before then, each and in, each individual state had their own money. So merchants who did business with all the 13 states were getting money from North Carolina, from New York, from Massachusetts, from whatever. A national bank would give us one currency, the dollar, and uh, would establish one unit of commerce and would be our national bank. Well, the Democratic Republicans, and they were led by Thomas Jefferson, did not like Alexander Hamilton. Talk about two people who hated each other. These two were total frenemies, okay? They were like Regina George and Katie, I can't remember her last name. I have to ask my daughter. She knows all about that. But they were total frenemies, okay? They would like go up to each other and be like, hey, George, or hey, sorry, hey, Tom, how are you today? I'm fine. How are you today, uh, Alexander? Well, it's great to see you, Tom. Oh, I hope everything's going well. Oh, everything's going great, Alexander. You too. 
I hate him. I mean, that's basically how it was when they would go against each other. I mean, they were really friendly to each other's face. They were very courteous and la, 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 la. But behind each other's back, they totally wanted to do each other in. Like, totally wanted to do each other in. So Do Thomas Jefferson started as an opposition to these Federalists. He uh, supported the needs and the aspirations of you know, farmers um, rather than the merchants. They supported a weak national government that left the states to make all the major decisions. They believed in a narrow interpretation of the Constitution. They opposed a national bank and tons of things, most, most all of things that Alexander Hamilton support it. They truly did. And Alexander Hamilton was so hated, y'all, that Thomas Jefferson's vice president killed him in a duel. Shot him in a duel because he was really disliked. I mean, this was a really big disliked guy. Well, now we're going to go over some important event, events and issues that have a really big deal to do with the early nation. The first one is the Judiciary Act of 1787. And this act set up a national court system. And that court system was made up of circuit courts, district courts, and the Supreme Court. And it was according to the Constitution. It established this federal court system as a way for federal laws to be enforced at the state level. And this is, again, one of Alexander Hamilton's ideas. The states, until this, you know, especially under the Articles of Confederation, were, were in complete control. And there was a lot of problems when we ran into things like collecting money, um, establishing state, uh, national laws, establishing a national army, establishing trade laws, import laws. There was a lot of a problem because every state kind of followed their own law. They followed their own set of rules. In fact, if you went to someone after the American Revolution, after a couple of years, and you asked them, are you an American? They would say, no, I'm a Virginian. Or no, I'm a uh, South Carolinian, Car Carolinian. Or no, I'm, you know, New Englander. I don't know. They would not say that they are Americans. They would identify with the state that they lived in rather than the United States of America. Well, the Judiciary Act of 1787 established this federal court system as a way for the national government to be enforced, to enforce their laws on the state level. It also made federal law be superior to state law. So if, if the federal law says no, I mean, if the state law says, oh, we're not going to do that, the federal law can step in and say, oh, yes, you are. And a big example of that is in the 1960s with the, um, uh, the desegregation act that President Kennedy, excuse me, President Johnson had put into effect. Some southern states had said, we are not going to desegregate. We refuse to desegregate. We refuse to do it. We're not going to do it. The state said that, the state level. Well, the national government stepped in and sent uh, the National Guard and said, oh, yes, you are. You are going to do this. So that's, was, that was put into place, and that gave us the ability to do that with the Judiciary Act of 1789. President Washington at this time was like a national hero. You know, some people you know, didn't like him. Of course, you're, you're not everybody's always going to like somebody. And that's why, I, okay, I try to explain this to my daughter. You are not going to be liked 100% by every single person. I guarantee there's some of you out there watching the Miss Meyer show. I can't believe it though. I mean, I, I can't imagine, but I know that there are some of you who say, Miss Meyer, you are so boring. I hate this class. I can't imagine that somebody would say that, but I know that there probably are because you're not going to always have everybody like you. It's just the way it is. Um, George Washington was the same thing. But the majority of people loved him. They loved G-Dog. And they wanted him to run for president indefinitely until he died. Well, G-Dog, he didn't want the job to begin with. He said, uh, no thank you. I'm going home to Mount Vernon to be with my grandkids. His daughter had uh, died. He was now raising his son's grandchildren, or his, actually his, step, his stepson's children at his house. And he wanted to go home. He wanted to be with Martha. He wanted to go to Mount Vernon. He wanted to plant crops and harvest grain. He wanted to do these things. He wanted to retire. So he decided, I am not going to have an indefinite term as president. 
because I am not a king. I'm not a monarch. Don't treat me like one. And it was with George Washington saying, no, I'm putting a limit to my time spent in office that we continue to have term limits today for presidents. Okay? His, uh, one of his legacies, his last... All right, so George Washington left a, a, a proclamation of neutrality. Now, George Washington knew that once he left office, someone else would take the job. Well, back then, um, the way the president and vice president were elected is not like today. They did not run on a single ticket. So it wasn't Washington and Adams, vote them in as one central unit. That was not the way it was. It was the person who got the most votes became president, and the person who got the second to most votes became vice president. Well, uh, Washington's vice president was John Adams. Now, John Adams and Washington did not really get along. Bye, see you later. Uh, uh, they did not really get along. And Washington knew um, that probably Adams was going to continue to run for government, and he may encounter uh, the office of presidency. Well, Adams was not as likable as George Washington. He really wasn't. And George Washington knew that they were going to have some rough times ahead, especially with Adams because he was a hot-tempered kind of guy. Well, with the breakout of war, during this time when Washington was leaving office, there was a breakout of war between France and Great Britain. So in 1793, the United States found itself in a really difficult position. We did not want to get involved in this war, but we didn't want to seem ungrateful to France because they had helped us win our independence. So, and we didn't want to really anger Great Britain because we didn't we knew we were not ready to take them on for a second time. So, the United States signed something called the Treaty of Alliance with France in 1778. Um and even though we signed this and said, hey, France, we're your buddies. You know, thanks for helping us out. We're, we're, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. When the time came, France said, hey, United States, you're going to come help us, right? We said, no, we're not. I'm sorry. We did it. So France was really upset. Really, really upset. This was all going on when George Washington was getting ready to leave office. So when he left office, he issued this proclamation, which is basically like, uh, I'm issuing a proclamation. I'm issuing a proclamation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what a proclamation is. And so George issued this proclamation and said basically that we are staying out of this war and we're not going to help either side. Well, this you can imagine how happy this made France with us. I mean, we were really at this point, we were having some serious. Now France was really not happy with us at all. And I know I keep messing with my hair. I'm so sorry. It's in my face and in my, ugh, it's driving me crazy. All right. Okay. Now. Jay's Treaty of 1794. Now, I have a very good friend of mine. Her name is Sunny, and she is fabulous. She used to work at H2O Spa in New Orleans, and um, now she lives in Beverly Hills and does hair there. But anyways, the only thing that we knew, she was one of my very best friends in high school, uh, the only re name we knew of John Jay was the Beauty College. Well, there was actually a John Jay, just like there was actually a Sam Adams. He is just not the name on, you know, adult beverages. John Jay was the chief justice who was sent to London on our behalf. He was our chief justice because tensions during the uh, reign of John Adams began to rise between the U.S. and the Great Britain, especially, especially during the whole time of the conflict between France and Great Britain, the British started to do something which really led us to the War of 1812. The British started to, they needed more soldiers. A lot of the soldiers that fought for them were in fact colonists. Indeed, our, our own G-Dog became so famous because he did such a great job in the French and Indian War, fighting on side of the British. Well, when Britain and France started to go to war, Britain needed more soldiers. They didn't have enough. So what they started doing was something called impressment. And that means that they would go and actually capture American ships 
and forced the sailors on those ships, those American sailors, to fight in the British Navy. Well, the American public were flipping out. They were saying, oh, we gotta go back to war. We're going back to war. Well, you know, John Adams, George Washington, John Jay, Sam Adams, all these people, they knew that that was not a very good idea because we would not be able to defeat them a second time, especially now that we had angered France by not helping them. We all know what a big role France played in helping us get our freedom. So, George Washington, and, well, Adams too, sent Chief Justice John Jay, a real person, to London in order to negotiate with the British. So the British, they, d they decided with this, they decided that they would withdraw their troops from the Northwest Territory, basically where they were camping out and kidnapping these soldiers, and uh, they would reinforce the boundaries agreed upon with the Treaty of Paris, which was the ending of the American Revolution. And in yeah. return, they would do this, meaning they would go away and they wouldn't kidnap any more people. But in return, the Americans would have to pay debts that were owed to British that they incurred before the revolution and before the Declaration of Independence, really. Kind of like the things that we did with tea and with uh, the stamp tax that we didn't pay and all these other kind of taxes that we refused to pay. Great Britain says, okay, you owe us still. You still owe us. You pay for us and then we'll leave you alone. And that was the treaty with John Jay of 1794. Now this was not, not a good thing for the American people because they hated it. It was so unpopular. It was so unpopular. People were like, we, why should we, we should never negotiate with Great Britain. And they did this to us and they killed my brother in, in you know, Bunker Hill and blah, 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 blah. It was just not popular at all. It was really unpopular also with other countries such as Spain because they thought that this meant that the U.S. was going to realign with Great Britain and that they once again, Great Britain really, would become this massive superpower. So in a, as a result of that, Spain made their own treaty with the United States. because they, So they went over to the United States and said, hey, hey, U.S., please don't align with Great Britain. Please don't do that. Align with us instead. Align with us. Well, what did Spain have that the U.S. wanted? What did Spain have that everybody wanted? What did Spain obtain from France after the French and Indian War? the New Orleans, New Orleans port. And owning New Orleans, New Orleans has the mouth of the Mississippi River. So if you have access to New Orleans, you have access to the mouth of the Mississippi, hence control of the Mississippi River. Well, in the, the treaty, which was called Pickney's Treaty, okay, Pickney's Treaty, I hope I'm saying it right. I know somebody out there is gonna correct me. I'm let, uh, Correct me if I'm saying it wrong. So they uh, signed this treaty, and what it did was it gave the United States the right to sail the Mississippi River and to use the port of New Orleans. It also agreed to give the U.S. lands in western Florida, you know, in that panhandle area. And this would made, made the Americans a little happy, and it also really made Spain happy, which in turn made, you know, I guess France a little happy, but not much because they were really ticked at us. The Whiskey Rebellion of 1794 is also a big thing because it starts to show how we start getting a lot of problems between the states. You already saw the issues that the states were having with the Great Compromise and the Three-Fourths Compromise and things like that. Well, the Whiskey Rebellion was something that, a rebellion, basically, and it happened in 1791. Now, Congress passed a tax on whiskey that was made in the United States. Well, you might think, well, so why would, you know, okay, why would people get so upset? Well, the majority of people that were living in the United States, especially in the South, were farmers. And they made, they grew the grain and they made the whiskey. So they were the ones, by having this big tax, they were the ones that were going to have to pay for it. Well, they disliked that the tax, they, dis they, they totally disliked the tax. And farmers in Pennsylvania decided that this tax was not fair and that they were going to not pay it. So in 1794, riots broke out and the federal government had to send militia to Pennsylvania to stop the riots. So you might say, well, what, so what, what's the big deal? 
Well, this was the first time that the federal government had to use force in order to make sure that the laws were being enforced. Nowadays, I know that after Katrina, the uh, National Guard was deployed all throughout New Orleans to make sure that uh, laws were being followed. There was lots of, you know, crime being committed, especially after the storm. So the uh, National Guard was, was sent out to kind of do like a, you know, martial law type of thing. And this, the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794, was the first time that that happened. The last, nope, not, not last thing. Oh, sorry, there's so much. I know, and I said I didn't want to make this video long. I'm so sorry. Well, okay, President Washington's farewell address of 1796. So before George Washington retired in 1797, he wrote a letter to the American people, and it detailed how he believed the country should be run. One of his main arguments was that the country should not enter into any extended treaties or agreements with other countries. He thought that by doing this, we could avoid foreign wars or get involved with wars that had nothing to do with us. For instance, if we, let's say we, you know, Baron von Steuben, the uh, German general had helped us you know, prepare for fighting in the American Revolution. If we would have entered into an, a treaty that lasted, I don't know, uh, 200, 300 years, well, only only 200 years, I'll say like that, then we wouldn't have been able to declare war on them in the war, uh, World War II. So uh, Washington knew that it would be a requirement to have treaties with countries, especially being as small as the United States was at this time, but he really, really, really uh, cautioned against something lasting a long period of time so that we could avoid being pulled into a war that had absolutely nothing to do with us. Okay? <laughs> okay, so um, another important point that Washington made was um, that the two political parties, Federalists and Anti-Federalists at this time, should try to get along better. He saw firsthand, this is, and this, like I said, y'all, well, I didn't say this, but like I always say, like I, I always say like I said, because I've said it before, I just haven't said it to you, but political party and political fighting, that's not something new. That isn't something that was just, you know, came about in the Obama administration. Political infighting has been around in the United States since day one. And George Washington saw the damage that it could do. He saw that it hindered progress. All this infighting did nothing except cause problems and frictions for the American people. So Washington said that the two major parties should try to get along better. He knew they didn't agree on many issues and he just believed that they could avoid a lot of problems in the future if they should, could try to unite for the good of the country. Well, in 1790s, after, you know, well, toward the end of Washington's presidency, tensions continued to grow between the U.S. and the France. Because France, of course, was angry at us for not helping them when we said we were. Well, in the late 1790s, uh, the French started to seize U.S. ships, same way that Great Britain did. And in 1797, the U.S. sent diplomats to France in order to negotiate the continuing peace between the two countries. The French were pretty upset, though, um, at us because our president at the time was a man named John Adams. And like I said before, John Adams was no George Washington. He was not, you know, this high, sweet guy that people just liked, a likable kind of guy. John Adams was not likable. He wasn't. He was not likable. Some people even said he smelled horrendously. I don't know how true that is. It was a rumor, but, you know, that's what some had said. But one thing that really angered the French and a lot of Americans too is that John Adams never held his tongue. He said exactly what was on his mind. He was not going to be somebody who's kind of walk, skirt around issues. He's going to be somebody who is going to say what he thinks. So John Adams had made some anti-French remarks, saying some things about the French people that were not very nice. Well, the French demanded that Adams apologize and they pay them $250,000. Well, for a brand new country that barely has enough money at all, and, and not to mention one that had to pay Great Britain back, $250,000 is a lot of money. But the problem was this. They were threatening to go to war. They were threatening 
if you don't do this, we're going to go to war with you. Well, John Adams and the, you know, the, the uh, Congress knew we were in no position to go to war, especially with France, who helped us win the original war. So John Adams, he did it. He uh, paid the money, said he was sorry, and went on. Well, this became known as the XYZ Affair, and it totally angered the American people because, once again, they thought that this was a sign of weakness, showing how weak we are. We need to be strong. But what they don't understand is that they're not ready. They think that they're, you know, the biggest, baddest country around. But the whole reason we won the American Revolution is because we had help. Now, you're going to go and fight a war by yourself? That's just not, we're not, they're not ready. So, this also made John Adams very unpopular. Very, even more unpopular than he was before. Okay, he was never really popular. But now he was even less popular. So, though there was not a formal declaration of war, like France never formally said we're going to go to war, it did scare us enough and scared Congress enough to know that we had to increase our armed forces. We need to get to, we needed to have a military ready to go. Okay? And that's what we started to do. Vivian is uh, having a conversation with her Barbies. They're over there and they're very loud. Okay, Barbies, excuse me. I'm trying to teach. Can you please keep it down? <laughs> All right. So, the Alien and Sedition Acts a lot of people uh, don't know about these, but they're so, like, okay, um, you guys probably don't remember. Maybe you do. But after 2011, um, excuse me, 2009-11, uh, just like all over the place, right? After 9-11 in 2001, um, we started to have a lot more uh, oversight, shall we say, on our daily lives. We started to have more, you know, uh, watchful eye on what was going on in order to protect us. Well, a lot of people got really upset about that. They did not like that idea at all. And I was in college. I was learning to be a history teacher. And I was saying, okay, but isn't this just like the Alien and Sedition Acts? Isn't this just like something we had in the very beginning? But, you know, a lot of people don't know that. But I'm going to, now you will. So, what are the Alien and Sedition Acts? Well, John Adams are very uh, popular popular president put into place something called the Alien and Sedition Acts. Well, in 1798, Congress passed four laws known as the Alien and Sedition Acts, and they were directed at the Democratic Republican Party and its supporters. The Alien Act increased the number of years that it required for a person to live in the United States before they could become a citizen. It was five years. After the passage of the Alien Act, it became 14 years. The Sedition Act made it illegal, and this was the big one that really angered people, made it illegal for U.S. citizens to say or write critical remarks about the government. So, Because a lot of people were saying some bad stuff about John Adams. They were saying some really bad stuff about him, like stuff I'm not even going to tell you. But when you get to college, you'll be like, wow, okay? All right. They were slandering him, so he made it a law illegal to do so. Well, this angered the people because in the Bill of Rights it says freedom of speech. Freedom, you can't do this. Well, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison started to write papers that protested these acts. Started to say that the states had a right to declare them to declare them null and void. The states have the right to say that these acts are unconstitutional, especially the Sedition Act, because it went against First Amendment rights. So in response, the state legislatures of Kentucky and Virginia passed resolutions saying that they could declare federal laws null and void. Well, the Federalists, like John Adams, thought that uh, only the Supreme Court could do this. And this started to kind of break out this war between state versus federal powers. This is all leading up, guys, to the Civil War. The southern states wanted to have more of power away from the federal government, where the northern states were just, you know, it was a different situation, which we're going to get into much later. So with the Alien and Sedition Act, with the resolutions saying that federal law could be declared unconstitutional by the states, with these issues, this really started to create a problem between the state and national powers. And this wasn't resolved until much later, um, eventually leading up until the, the Civil War.
Well, in the election of 1800, surprise, surprise, John Adams did not win a second term. He did not. The person who, and they were still doing this system where the person who has the most votes is president, the person who has the second to most votes is vice president. Well, the person who won presidency was Thomas Jefferson. Now, Thomas Jefferson was the exact opposite of John Adams. Truly, the exact opposite. And in fact, Thomas Jefferson was John Adams, vice president. But they were complete opposites. So you can imagine how much work got done. Well, Thomas Jefferson and his vice president was a man named Aaron Burr. Well, they became, you know, that's the way that they did. So, uh, at the Federalists at the time pretty much dominated the House of Representatives. Um, and they actually at that time had the right to select the president. And it almost came to a point where they elected Aaron Burr. And just in order to deny the presidency from Thomas Jefferson. Because the Federalists, these were the ones who wanted more of a centralized national government. Well, both Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr did not like that idea. Really, they did not. So the Senate, excuse me, the House Representatives at this time, they did not want Thomas Jefferson to become president. They did not want him to be there. They said, oh, no, 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 this guy doesn't like a centralized government. He doesn't like it. Let's not get him. We Let's get Aaron Burr instead. Well, Alexander Hamilton, of all people, went to the House of Representatives. All right. So Aaron Burr, I mean, excuse me, Tom, ugh, Alexander Hamilton went there and actually convinced the House of Representatives to elect Thomas Jefferson over Aaron Burr because he was the lesser of two evils, in his opinion. Well, uh, in 1804, the 12th Amendment was passed, and it separated the voting for president and vice president meaning they voted for one person for president and they voted for another person for vice president and not this first votes you get president I mean first largest amount of votes gets president second largest gets vice president with the 12th amendment 12th 12th ugh, I can't say that right uh, it separated the voting all right so we are going to talk about three more things and then we're going to be done I promise we're talking about a major court case next, and that is Marbury versus Madison, and that's in 1803. Well, at the end of Tom John Adams' term, he appointed some of his supporters to positions in judges' seats and in court offices. They were called midnight judges because they did not receive their documentation to begin their positions before Adams left office. So they got this position this, like at the, the last possible second. Now, the reason he did this was because he uh, wanted them in office during jo Thomas Jefferson's presidency. Because Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, because Thomas Jefferson and John Adams differed so greatly on national government issues, John Adams wanted to kind of secure the his place in government. He wanted to put his people into place so that things that Thomas Jefferson wanted to do would not get passed, especially when they had to deal with uh, the central government. Well, Thomas Jefferson, when he became elected president, he instructed the Secretary of State, which was James Madison, to not give these appointees their papers. He said, uh-uh, this is, this is shady. We are not doing this. Well, one appointee from John Adams, Will, William Marbury, he sued Madison for his papers. And the case, Marbury v. Madison, made it all the way to the Supreme Court in 1803. There, Chief Justice John Marshall, he stated the opinion that the court did not have the power to make Madison give Marbury his papers. The court ruled that the part of the Judiciary Act of 1789 that granted the court the power to do so was unconstitutional. Now, what is the point of this? This is the first time the Supreme Court declared an act of Congress unconstitutional. And what happened? Marbury did not get his position. So all those midnight appointees didn't make it. So it didn't matter. John Adams, I guess it was a good idea. It just didn't work. Okay. The next thing we're going to talk about is the Louisiana Purchase. Louisiana, 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 Louisiana. So, go play. 
Go. No. Yeah. No. Okay, I guess I'm going to have a, a helper here for the next two parts. Everyone, this is Miss Vivian Lee. She is uh, my daughter, my little daughter, my youngest one. And she's, how many? How many are you? Say two. How many? No, you're not that many. You're this many. No, hold up. How do you think of that? She's this many. She's two. How old are you? Two. Say two. Three. No, she's not three. And she took a pen and wrote all over herself. So that's why she looks like this. Well, the Louisiana Purchase. In 1803, the Lu United States acquired the Louisiana Territory from France. Why is this a big deal? We acquired it. This more than doubled the size of the United States. It was immensely huge. It gave us a big old section of the United States that was owned by France. It also gave us New Orleans. It gave us the Mississippi Delta area. Now, why did we get it? Why? Well, Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon Bonaparte, hey, Napoleon Bonaparte! <laughs> well, Napoleon was fighting war with Britain at this time. Lord Nelson with the British. Y'all learn that when we go over world history. Well, Lord Nelson was like the bomb, okay? He like really totally was, was Britain's like most famous admirable, uh, admiral ever. Well, Napoleon needed cash. He needed to go and fight Nelson. He needed to fight the British. And he needed cash now. So it was, at one point, we already had tried to buy this land from France. And France said, no, goodbye. Bye. Bye. What do you say, Lou? Say bye. <laughs> France said no. Well, all of a sudden, Napoleon calls up and he says, hey, Tom. Or well, not like this. <laughs> he says, hey, Tom, you want to buy Louisiana? It's for sale. I'll sell it to you, cheap. So we got a serious deal on it. Well, Thomas Jefferson had sent two, uh, uh, what is that, what word I want to use? Mm, delegates over to France to go and negotiate this deal. Well, the, he was selling it so cheap that the delegates bought the land without even contacting Thomas Jefferson, the president. Because they couldn't just pick up a cell phone and say, Mr. President, uh, we need to do this. It, they'd have to write a letter. They'd have to send it. They'd have to wait for a response. Well, Napoleon was not the kind of guy that you just mess around with. He was not, uh, shall we say, I don't know, uh, reliable. And he was prone to changing his mind. So these two delegates, these American delegates, went and said, yes, we'll buy the land without even talking to Jefferson. And Jefferson had not even talked to Congress. So the president did not have the ability to buy these lands. It was uh, not even in his power as president to do that. It was Congress who had to agree to do that. Well, Napoleon was selling it so cheap, so fast, we had to act on it now. Like, get it now. And we did. And that was the uh, Louisiana Purchase. Kind of like, um, I have such an issue with, like, okay, like if I see something. Okay, let me show you this. Watch. Where is? Hold on. I'm going to show you this. Okay. Well, all right. So, uh, for my birthday, um, I decided that I wanted to get a new purse. Well, it, my birthday's in July, and around, hmm, I'd say May, I had gone shopping and I saw this beautiful Michael Kors purse, and it was just so pretty. And I really, really wanted it. It is pretty. What color is it? Orange. Well, I really wanted it. But it wasn't my birthday yet. It's a moment yet. Yes, it was on sale. Like a hundred dollars off. A hundred dollars. Lou. Lou. It was a hundred dollars off. Oh. So I had to buy it. Couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. I just bought it. Just boom. Kind of like they had to do because it was on sale. Louisiana was basically on sale. And if we waited too long, it would go off a of sale. We had to pay even more. So we had to do that. So we did it, and we asked for forgiveness. Thankfully, Congress said, all right, we'll, we'll overlook that. Don't do it again, Jefferson. Don't do it again. Don't. Go time out, Jefferson. <laughs> ha. Go time out, Jefferson. No. No, no not you. You don't have to go. Do, do, you, do you go to time out a lot? Yes. Oh, yes. Do you go, do you go to time out? 
Uh-uh. You don't? Stop. That's not true. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, <clears throat> last thing we're going to talk about is the Embargo Act of 1807. Well, at the time of the Embargo Act of 1807, Great Britain and France were fighting in a war. Nelson versus Napoleon. Nelson versus Napoleon. Well, yeah. So both countries wanted to restrict restr restrict trade with the other country. Both countries said that they would attack ships heading to their enemy's ports. Well, the United States at this time were neutral. We didn't what? want to get involved. So we were trading with both countries. We were trading with France and we were trading with England. So we passed something called the Embargo Act. And what it did it is it prohibited American exports to all foreign ports. Okay, so the U.S. hoped that this would keep them out of the war between Great Britain and France. Okay, we said that we're going to do that. We're going to, uh, we're not going to sell anything. Basically, it said we're not going to give anything to France, sell anything to France. We're not going to sell anything to Great Britain. We're going to stop. Okay, so that's what it did. Well, obviously, this hurt American businesses more than helped them because American businesses were doing a lot of business with England and France. And by passing the Embargo Act, it said that they no longer could sell those goods to these countries, any foreign countries, in fact. Well, it was lifted because obviously the people were ticked off and they passed the Non-Intercourse Act. And this allowed American exports to all other countries except uh, Great Britain yeah, and France. Okay, Try okay. making it, you know, okay, because like, that, that was silly. Like, why throw the baby out with a bathwater? Why you punish them from everything? Kind of like this. Say you're in a classroom and um, you have one student that throws, uh, that yells at the teacher and says, "You, you are stupid, Miss Meyer." Well, the teacher turns around and says, "You're all punished. No, no recess." For the whole rest of the year. Well, why punish all the kids? Why? When you know it was just that one. So with the Non-Intercourse Act, it just restricted those exports from the two countries that were fighting with us and let us continue to do business with Spain, with uh, Latin America, with places in Africa, with China, <coughs> and such like that. So that's all I got for you. I know it was a lot longer than I had totally... Ah! intended. Uh, see you guys next time on the Miss Meyer Show. Say bye. Bye. Say bye. Blow kiss. Yeah.